beginning, you know, every year to think up titles, provocative titles, or <laughs> interesting new titles that would stimulate interest. After you've been through Buddhism today and the usual <laughs> the Four Noble Truths and the, the usual titles and you start thinking up, uh, you start having to become more original. You know? So the title today, The End of Death, is, uh, is this is a reflection I particularly uh, found very worthwhile investigating. Um, because we usually perceive death as, as the end of life and, and to us, uh, say, the ordinary person, the death is, is a kind of, is, it's a mystery, it's a finality, uh, and we, and because of that we tend to either, you know, not really want to talk about it or think about it because we find it maybe depressing or frightening in itself. When, when we were, uh, when they wanted to print the book Mindfulness Path to the Deathless, I remember the, at first we, I, I called it the Path to the Deathless. Then somebody said, nobody will read a book called, with the word death in it. I said, but it's deathless. They said, well, <laughs> but they, they said, still it has the word death in it. And so they wanted, at least, uh, so they, we compromised and had mindfulness as the first inspiring word. But it's interesting to see that in the uh, present time, the age uh, that we're in is, death is a subject that, that people are willing to consider, contemplate. We have... Uh, Every year we have a, a weekend retreat on death and dying, and and it's always booked up in advance. And that's always impressed me. People would want to spend a weekend, you know, look forward to a weekend just devoted to death and dying. But that does show a change in people's, many people's attitude and an interest in the great event of our life, because death is something we all uh, we will all experience. It's an important event. It isn't something to to regard as a, some a subject to ignore or to fear, but to uh, say look forward to. Not in a not because you're fed up with life or 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 want to kill yourself, but because it is the combination of this this experience of, of from birth to death. So it. It is a very important event. It's the ending of this uh, conscious experience within this form that was born and has reached its time to die. And then the, the end of death is what? What do we mean by that? Now in the Sutta Nipata, uh, the, there's a quote in, uh, that I particularly like which I will read. This is interesting uh, contemplation. It reads thus, uh, There is an island, an island which you cannot go beyond. It is a place of nothingness, a place of non-possession and of non-attachment. It is the total end of death and decay. And this is why I call it Nibbana. There are people who in mindfulness have realized this and are completely cool here and now. They do not become slaves working for Mara, for death. They cannot fall into his power. And so it's interesting also to, to realize Mara, the, this word Mara, often translated as the tempter or the, the, the evil force, is the word for death. And, and Amara, Amaravati, is uh, is the deathless, the deathless realm, 
And so, contemplating what it means, the, the total end of death and decay, uh, and this realization of this, this, this realization, this island that you cannot go beyond, this is a, uh, also a very significant symbol, religious symbol, the island. Not in, a, in, a, in the sense of an island that is uh, isolated, that uh, you're cutting yourself off from everything, going off to, to a place where, where nothing can, uh, can contact you again. But it, it, is, it does symbolize the, the way things are as a, as a spiritual realization of going to the very center, to the, maybe the axis mundi or the, the place that you cannot get beyond. And that, say, within yourself, say, each one of us uh, is, a, is a separate individual entity. When we're born, then we spend our lifetime always within the confines uh, of, this, of this human shape, this human body. And for us, then, life is experienced as the objective world comes to us, impinges on this, this form, on its senses. And so in, in actual, uh, the reality of our existence lies the fact that each one of us is, is, is an island unto ourselves, just physically. And that each one of us has to live in, in somewhat isolation, in this lonely state of being one separate individual entity. Uh, and we oftentimes look outward to seek union or companionship or relationship with other beings hoping to maybe stem this, uh, this sense of loneliness or isolation that we have in this form. But the Buddha pointed the way towards a realization that wasn't, that was, was taking us say, away from the, that desire to, to find something out there that because when we follow the desire, all we get is maybe temporary companionship uh, now and then. Uh, maybe we can distract ourselves from, from our loneliness and our isolation uh, through, you know, becoming interested or infatuated or caught up into the lives, emotions and, and uh, the relationship with, with other beings. But in the long run, we're left, say, with ourselves, with, with just this, this conscious experience within this limited form. And so in mindfulness is the ability to realize that it's not, not a, uh, it's not a, it, when, we, when we are really mindful, when there is true mindfulness, awareness operating, we begin to discover or rediscover or realize that very centeredness, that point where there is no, no thingness or nothingness, non-attachment, non-possession, that isn't conditioned by language or culture or education. It's the pure awareness of the mind that we the, the pure, pure intelligence of being that we begin to realize. It is the, and it is there at that point that there is the island. You can't get beyond it. You can't, you can't get beyond the island and see the island. You can only be there and observe and witness and, and know that all that comes to the island and leaves it all that, that arises ceases, the, the meetings, the partings, the arrivals and departures, or they're the, they're the guests, the, the things, the possessions uh, that come and go, that impinge, that, that affect us, that affect this conscious experience, but we're no longer looking at it in the way that we used to. The way of ignorance is to, to want to hold on to, this, to the good things, isn't it? Those things that come to us that are very pleasant, beautiful, attractive, uh, 
desirable, uh, pleasing to us. We, when they come to us, we want to hang on, grasp them. And then, then we live in a lot of fear of having to, to put up with things coming to us that are unwanted, painful, uh, disgusting, uh, repulsive. And so we can, we can spend our lives in a constant state of anxiety about even when we have, maybe uh, we, we're able to maybe control our lives enough to supply enough of the good things to kind of give us a, a sense of ownership and possession. But there's always, related to that possessiveness, a fear of losing it. That when, when, uh, when, when you love somebody and you're attached to them, there's always, going along with that, the fear of losing them. That's a part of the deal, unless you're a wise being. <laughs> so, this is pointing it out, as, as uh, even when we, you know, at the best moments of our life, where maybe the, the peak experiences where we manage to maybe get all we want, all that is desirable, that along with that is the, what we call the dark side or the shadow, which means the, 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 the kind of intuitive awareness that it, it will be taken away, will be separated. In modern society, we've we've lost our appreciation, say, of death of the of the way of deathlessness or the realization of immortality. Even even the the religions tend to ignore this. We tend to think of it as something that that we hopefully will 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 realize. When we are, when we die, you know, so so we think. Um, well, maybe if I live a good life and do all the right things, when I die, I will find some kind of eternal place of, like heavenly state, where there's a kind of eternal happiness. Because in 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 our minds, we when we try to conceive deathlessness or immortality. We, we tend to make it into eternity, in that it's some, some kind of thing or, or state of being which goes on and on and on, either uh, eternally uh, pleasing, pleasant and comfortable, or eternally painful, like eternal hell, is, is also uh, something that, that we, uh, we, have, we have those kind of perceptions in the uh, Christian uh, in our Christian conditioning that some people who are so bad they're condemned to eternal hell unmitigated misery forever uh, which is about the most horrible thing you can think of <laughs> and then the then the uh, uh, then the opposite is eternal happiness where we're just happy forever and ever, uh, and and that happiness oftentimes is is like having everything you want, isn't it? Or being with, with everything you like and love uh, at its peak, where where everybody's attractive and young and and happy and and uh, loving and delicious and everything's just at its best. The the peak of of all the sense realm forever, eternal peak moment uh, is, is maybe a description of eternal heaven. But the Buddha avoided those kind of perceptions and, and spoke in terms of Nibbana. This, this is why I call it Nibbana. A place of no thingness or nothingness. And yet that can sound to, to the average person as a, as a, play, a kind of Annihilation, a dead place where where everything just disappears into a a vacuum, a void, a kind of sterile void of 
of total wipeout is 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 one interpretation, a place of no thingness, or it is uh, non-attachment or non-possession. Because our minds easily tend to absolutize, to fix, and to see things in in a in in extreme ways, uh, and this is our this is our this is our culture or the way of the mind is conditioned to to take things to extremity. That it's interesting to to observe that the Buddha's emphasis was on the middle way rather than on extremity. And the middle way, uh, oftentimes interpreted in uh, in Britain here, is a kind of endless, kind of mediocre, mediocre compromising, <laughs> where <laughs> where you you just the kind of trying to be, uh, you know, not extreme, but always in the state a kind of of uh, never being committed to to anything, but just. I just follow the middle way, and so which means that I I wouldn't dare do anything, or or commit myself to any any extremity. But the middle way of the Buddha is not mediocrity. It's not just being wishy-washy, but it is uh, it's transcending the extremities. It's where the the extremes we we begin to see the complementariness of of the extremes. We we're no longer looking aimed at our life at the extremities and being attracted or repelled by the conditions in their extreme uh, form, because we we find the place of non-abiding or of no thingness or non-attachment, and that isn't that isn't a place as a as an external place or. Uh, it's not a fixed position. We're not trying to to live a life where we where we don't feel, we don't experience, we don't have to put up with anything. We just go into a state of nothingness, non-attachment, and uh, and just it's like shut down and 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 not be impinged on anymore. Not have to participate in life as a human being. Not have to feel or experience anything, but just find a nice little uh, mental state uh, that we're totally protected from the sensitive, the sensitivity that that frightens us. But that is that is uh, that uh, that is why sometimes the Buddha was accused of being a nihilist or an annihilationist, because logically, if you take the the extremity, if you use anatta as an extremity, or emptiness, or desirelessness, or no thingness, as as the opposite of somethingness, if you look at it in that, in, in as uh, as two two opposites polarized, then of course the the, the logic is the, is uh, an annihilationist teaching. One ends up thinking the Buddha was teaching extinction, nibbana as as a kind of total wipeout and destruction of everything, and that is that is because the the, the uh, awareness, the kind of intuitive awareness that the Buddha uh, uh, pointed to is not is is not recognized, and we're just following uh, the logic of our of our logical conditioned mind. Now I've been talking a lot about intuition as a as a mental experience that is not really acknowledged in Western civilization. We don't trust it. We don't uh, regard it as as being anything uh, all that worthy. It's kind of maybe an aside. We talk about it as a kind you kind of feel something or. You say women are very intuitive, which is is a, a way of kind of even saying it's not terribly important. <laughs> Dismissing it because intuition isn't you can't you can't really get it 
and deliver the goods, can you? It's not intuitive awareness. Isn't it? Is is baffling to a human being who's very caught up in in wanting to think about life and figure it all out in rational terms, have every have it all kind of organized with perceptions A, B, C, D, on to Z, all neatly computerized, arranged, and say, this is, this is everything. And, and this we would, we would really feel very, we would tend to, at least temporarily, may, maybe be quite comfortable with the fact that we own all the knowledge in the world, even though we may not ever use it, the fact that we, we have it in a, in, a, in a computer or something might we might be able to, for a few moments, feel that we're okay, that, that everything is all right. Because we do, we do value very much our ability to, to create images, to perceive things, to, to use language, to remember. All this, this, this function of the mind has been highly developed or in the past few centuries and highly regarded. And it, isn't uh, not to be critical of it or to dismiss it or to to despise it in any way, but to recognize that as long as our attention is caught in the attachment to the conditioning of the mind, to the perceptions, to views, to opinions, to no matter how good they might be or or high-minded or altruistic, altruistic, the the attachment itself to these conditions of the mind creates this, this sense of, of worry and despair in our lives. Because no matter how clever we are, our cleverness will only, can, can delude us. We, we tend to fool ourselves with our own intelligence and not uh, be able to relate to the actual flow of our lives because we're always projecting onto to life something that isn't really there, something of our own desire, our own fear. We project it onto the moments of our life. So intuitive awareness is the ability to, to reflect and observe, to contemplate, to ponder. What is life all about? What is the meaning of life? Why were we born? What is death? What happens when we die? And these are, we're not trying to find answers, it's kind of nice little answers from, from, uh, from a book, but these are the questions that really interest us and which we can only maybe use as an opportunity to open up our mind to its, say, its intuitive function or its intuitive ability. And so asking oneself a question like this that has no answer in, 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 in terms of a rational answer, but it, it allows the, us to ponder, to wonder about the meaning of life, to, which means that we, we're opening the mind. We're not fixing on a, on, a, on a neat little answer to the question. But it keeps kind of working inside you. And, and it oftentimes is quite bothersome because uh, we can feel quite ill at ease with not knowing things and not, not having uh, really good answers to all the important questions. Sometimes we feel very ill at ease when, we, when, we, when we're in that, with that doubting state, that uncertainty, that insecurity, that not knowing. And so the immediate reaction is to, is to either dismiss it, ignore the question, not bother with it, or to settle for somebody else's answer. Go to the priest, go to the monk, read the philosophy, get the answer from somebody, and, uh, and maybe settle for what somebody tells you. And what the Buddha was asking us to do was to, to trust, put our faith in that intuitive openness that's not fixed, not, not attached to anything. It's no thingness, nothingness, non-attachment, non-possession.
Now, there's a Shakespearean sonnet, that probably many of you are aware of, that has that. that I'll see if I can recite it. The, the, Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, fooled by those rebel powers that thee array. Why dost thou pine within and suffer dearth, painting thy outward walls so costly gay? Why so large cost, having so short a lease, dost thou upon thy fading mansion spend? Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, eat up thy charge? Is this thy body's end? Then, soul, feed thou upon thy servant's loss, and let that pine to aggravate thy store by terms divine in selling hours of dross within be fed without be rich no more so shalt thou feed on death that feeds on men and death once dead there's no more dying then <laughs> sometimes you think Shakespeare understood <laughs> And the last line, and death wants dead, isn't it? And, this, this, and so the, the, in, say, in our own practice of meditation, we're actually allowing death to happen inside us. And this is sometimes the, the kind of fear that, and terror that come in our meditation practice, because we're willing, we, we have to be willing to let things, what, let that which we like and are attached to and possess, not, we're not trying to get rid of it, we're just trying to, to, to uh, say, give everything away or to just suppress all our feelings. But we're willing to let them go, which means we're willing to let them die inside our minds, which is, which when, when you look, especially when you're, when you're letting go something you really like, something you really want, some real, really strong desire, and you're letting go of it, that means you're not suppressing it. You're not just, you know, running away or distracting yourself into something else. You are willing to bear the feeling of it and recognize this desire and to let it be until it ceases until it naturally ceases. And that is, takes, of course, a, a tremendous faith in the Dhamma practice and patience. And in the process, there's also a feeling of, of great loss and of death as you're still alive. And this I've found, you know, in my, is from my own practice, I noticed how some things were so like it was easy to you know many things one quite willing to let go of and were quite pleased when they were you know and they think well I've let go of that and and thank goodness it's like these kind of bad things and unwanted things but there's also a lot of really nice things interesting fascinating things that we keep wanting to hold on to and not give up and to really let them go is, and to trust in that feeling that comes, that sense of dying inside yourself. And I remember uh, when I was a, uh, a younger monk, uh, I, just, I used to have this, these, these kind of experiences of terror where I feel, I'm dying, I'm dying. It's, I'm, this monastic life is terrible. It's all about dying and death. And, and uh, I want to live. I want... And the, the, the kind of desire mind would go amok inside. You'd feel, I've got to get out of here. This Buddhism is, is demonic. <laughs> because the, you could feel this, this dying going on. And you, and you felt you were dying. And, and that uh, you shouldn't be. That, that, that meditation should be maybe something that makes you happy all the time. You should be, you know, meditating and just feeling bliss and joy and love and union with the universe and and uh, all the best, that you, all of the most wonderful, inspiring concepts and perceptions you can have about, you know, 
that, that, that the poets write about, and that they, positive thinkers, uh, keep uh, thinking. But then, in the process of this, of, the, of developing this path, the middle way of the Buddha, then there is this death once dead, there is no more dying. And it was a, it's a, like Lung Po Cha used to, he used to say shocking things to people when they'd first come to the monastery, like Western people. And they'd be, this is a great meditation master. Ajahn Chah is one of the really great meditation masters, very wise, enlightened, uh, master in Thailand and and they'd be sitting in front of him you know expecting some kind of marvelous uh, inspiring Dhamma talk and then he'd say did you come here to die? <laughs> <laughs> this is very hard to translate because I had to translate this stuff sometimes and and, it, and you felt you know this isn't exactly what you wanted to be saying to these people you know, that those days I, was, I wanted to, you know, I thought I wanted to inspire them so that they'll stay and maybe practice. But this is going to frighten them away. <laughs> That's a direct question, confrontation. Did you come here to die? But it is a startling question, isn't it? it it's shocking, and because they didn't, they would never have come to to a monastery like that to die. They came to to find the answers. Uh, uh, or eternal happiness, or liberation, enlightenment, to to be able to solve their personal problems, or whatever, uh, they're all uh, coming to to get something and to be able to to increase the quality of their life and be happier than they are. But this is 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 a is a question that that kind of shocks you. Did you come here to die? But it does. It's a question you never forget either. It, it sticks in your mind. And, it's, and something that sticks in your mind is something you can reflect on. And sometimes it, even though there may be, initially you were shocked and repelled by, by the question or frightened by it, it has its, its power over your lifetime to suddenly, you know, maybe begin to ponder that, not just react to it, to consider it, to contemplate it. Now the results of, of a, a life of meditation, say, in, in, in so far, say, from my own experience, is that, that more and more the, the sense of death is something that you realize is only uh, the ending of what was born. And even though uh, this is quite obvious on the, on the intellectual plane, it's not so uh, on the emotional plane, it, it takes a while for this to really sink in and to appreciate it. Because it, then the words like deathlessness or no thingness, emptiness, or anatta, no, non-self, or, or the nibbana, these, these kind of words that, that one was quite bewildered by in the beginning because one was interpreting it from a logical mind. Suddenly these words are very significant because they're pointing to the island that you cannot go beyond. And you're, 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 you're not looking for it, but you, you realize that's what you really are in terms of, of, of the realization of the way it is at this moment. Each one of us is, is, is there already in the deathless, the place you cannot go beyond, the place of non-attachment, of non-possession, of no-thingness. But we're not aware of it. And we're, we are so caught up into the conditioning of our minds, in the force of habit, in the fears and desires that, that, uh, that tend to uh, obsess our conscious experience. And so the meditation process is this willingness to relinquish, letting go, not, not destroying, not uh, getting rid of, but letting things, letting things go, allowing things to go according to their nature, and abiding 
trusting in just that attentiveness of mind, the willingness to just listen and watch, pay attention, ponder, consider, contemplate, reflect upon. And so when the internal dying takes place, you're reflecting on it. You're willing to experience death before your body dies. And what the, and the insight of that is that you realize all that dies is what was, whatever, what was born or what begins. So death once dead, there's no more dying then. Like feed thou upon thy servant's loss, and let thy let that pine to aggravate thy store by terms divine, in selling hours of dross, within be fed without be rich no more. This, like the by letting these these internal things, these attachments, these obsessions, these desires, fears, both on the positive and negative side, not to annihilate, get rid, or destroy, but to let them nourish you. Let them go. Not to, not to hold on. Not to identify or to be frightened and, and repress them. But to allow them to go their natural way. Let them cease. Let them die. Let everything die within you. And what is left? In, uh, in Thailand where when somebody dies, they always ask the monks to chant a very brief passage in Pali. Two lines, and, and uh, I remember when I first uh, when I first went to a, a kind of funeral in Thailand, and we chanted, Anicca vada sankara ubatava yatamino ubat chittava niru chanti de sang ubasamo sukho, and we chant that three times. It translates as all conditions are impermanent. They arise and they pass away, and in their passing is peace. And this is the reflection, a monastic reflection on death in, on a, in a Thai Buddhist funeral. Now that's a very profound reflection, actually. Because all that, uh, all, everything, all conditions are impermanent. They arise and they pass away, and in their passing is peace. So, in that reflection, we will, we, you know, we apply that maybe to the death of, of somebody, a person who died. So that might be comforting in the fact that they've, they're now peaceful. But apply that also to the experiences of your own mind, in your own feelings, your, your own desires and fears. When you let them pass away, all that arises ceases, comes and goes, and in its passing is peace. So when death once dead, there's no more dying, then the, 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 the result of letting go of the mortal realm of attachment and identity with, with the mortal realm is the experience of peace or the realization of Nibbana, or the realization of the deathless, or no-thingness. And it's not uh, of a sterile void of nothingness. It's not, it's not, because that's not the way things are. We recognize that, in, uh, that, we're, that this experience that we're right now involved with, in this sense realm, on this planet, it's, uh, it's, it's a dynamic, vibrant energy that we're all experiencing. We're, we're, in a, we're not in a static uh, material realm, or, a, or any, we're not petrified, we're not, we're not stuck in anything, where there's, no, there's nothing that, that isn't in the... Everything is, all the conditions are in, continuously in the process of change. And the only constant that is in, that that say is able to observe this is the intuitive awareness, say within our own uh, human state. The the way of of realizing this is not through believing in the 
in the ideas, but in actually uh, being aware, allowing this intuitive awareness to operate. That stillness of being, that sense of, of silent watching, silent listening, Now we can also contemplate this in in uh, in different uh, in just the ex- uh, kind of mundane experiences of of daily life. When we contemplate the relationship of form to space, isn't it just on visual conscious experience? We begin to to observe just using uh, say the the day the light that were, uh, of, of the room and the, the space and the, and the forms, the things that inhabit it. And this is, a, this is to ponder the relationship of, of forms to the space they're in. Have you ever thought of doing that? You know, just contemplating it. And, and asking yourself questions about, you know, how do you do it? You know, where the space can I can I see space, or do do I just see uh, the form? Because space doesn't have a; it's not something you can can see as a thing, is it? But it's something you're aware of in its in the relationship to the forms that that the forms that are in the space. So. We begin to to see the forms which come and go. They just in this room, we 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 can contemplate the fact that we all came in this room. We'll all leave this room. And so the uh, the uh, this, the things you know, like we all of us we because we came in, we'll, we'll eventually leave. The space was always here, even before the room was here. And when this building falls down, the space will still be here. <laughs> so the, actually the building comes and goes in the space. And, and so we, but the, 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 so that the, say the space is, is the constant. And it, and it is, it is deathless in other words. It's not, it's not something that begins and ends. But the conditions that come and go the, the, the room itself, the building itself, you know, is, are, say, the things that, that come and go. And this is just using visual uh, consciousness as, as a reflection. Contemplated in terms of sound in silence. How many of you listen to silence? Or do you just hear sounds? You know, so... This is, a, this is another thing to ponder, to, to investigate in your meditations. Uh, you can listen, like with, with listening, you can hear yourself thinking. At least I can. I can hear, you know, I can, I can kind of turn my, like my hearing ability, so I'm not just, you know, trying to pick up sounds external, but I can hear my, my own uh, thoughts. My, my feelings going on. I can listen to, to the grumbling mind or the complaining or the, the worrying mind. And in that listening, one is paying attention. One is not, one isn't judging. As soon as I start judging, I saying, oh, here I go again, worrying, grumbling again. I shouldn't, I should be grateful for all the good things in my life and here I am, you know, complaining about this and that, then I'm condemning the, 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 the condition. That's not, and I'm very good at that, being very condemning. But then I'm just caught in the, in the, in, in the condemning tendency of the mind and not listening to that either. So that the, like internal, listening inwardly, I found very helpful uh, kind of practice of meditation. Spend, I used to, in, in Thailand, I used to just spend so much time listening to, to, my, to my mind. 
And, and because I had a very active mind, very uh, kind of obsessed, uh, uh, con- it seemed like I never never had a moment's rest from the from the, the the kind of negative states of mind that seemed to, in the early years of practice, seemed to uh, be foremost in in my conscious experience. Once in a while, they'd, they'd kind of fall down and you'd get a few moments of bliss. And I wish I could keep this. <laughs> and that, as soon as you, you, you think that, you've lost it. Because you, you're wanting it. And then you're trying to get it. And then you can't get it. And then you go back into the old negative mode again. So the silent listener, silent watcher, listening to the silence. And I've taught, um, I've, I talk about and teach the, the so- using the sound of silence, the kind of background uh, uh, ringing sound, the kind of, uh, that one can, can pick up. I mean, if you pay attention, there's a kind of almost electric uh, pitch in the mind, or wherever it is. You can hear it even when when you plug your ears up, or you can hear it when you. Underwater, swimming underwater. <laughs> so whatever it is, uh, it's it's not to don't make anything out of it, but. It, it is a useful realization to use that as, as something to pay attention to. And it will help you to, to be able to put into perspective your own kind of thinking mind. Listening to the, to the space between words and thought. So that you can, you begin to see the thoughts are, you know, very quick, very fast. They, they come and go. But you, you're, you're concentrating, you're noticing, paying special attention to the space between thoughts or the beginning before you think and after you've thought something. So you're, you're acknowledging, you're kind of training, you're, you're informing your consciousness with the way things are, the, uh, the relationship of form to space, the relationship of sound to silence, the relationship of words to, no, to, to thought to non-thought, uh, then the relationship of self to, to the, of atta to anatta, or self to non-self, to, to note when there is a sense of me and mine and myself and to be able to realize when there is non-self. And so this, this way, uh, this is what we call developing the, the path or the middle way of the Buddha. So the, the, the relationship, the death, is the door to the deathless. Rather than death is the ending of everything, blank, <laughs> Death is a frightening thing because you, you you'd rather hang on to to the misery that you you know than uh, than go into go and, and die and when you're taking a risk you don't know what's going to happen then maybe because you stole uh, an apple from the neighbor's orchard when you were five years old you might have to do a time in purgatory or something don't know or reincarnation you might get re- reincarnated as some awful thing remember when, when I was in Australia a few years ago I met a man who was he had very strong views about reincarnation he says we don't believe that once you're a human being you could ever uh, be reincarnated in anything lower than that some people believe that that you can be reincarnated into some lower form like an animal uh, but we believe that once you've made it into the human state, then you, uh, your reincarnations will always be human or above that, into the realm of the gods. And so this was, he made this very strong uh, statement about what he believed in. And, uh, and I said, well, 
I think it's always good to reflect. You know, you could be reborn as a toad or some awful <laughs> creature. Just because it, the possibility of that makes you, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if you think about it, you're going to try to uh, adapt your behavior on a higher level. Where if you think, you know, I made it to a human being, I can do anything now. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like going to confession, isn't it? Whatever you've done, you just confess it and then it's okay after that. Uh, and so you feel, well, I can do anything and then always confess it and get away with it. Don't have to pay a punishment because maybe confessions become kind of perfunctory. But when you, you know, when you're, we're just trying to, say, understand the way things are, it's not a matter of deciding whether it's possible to be reborn as a, as a frog or as a human or as a, as a deva in the next life. Maybe it's true. But maybe, but what, what actually is the rebirth process now? And this I can see is that if I think, if I think on a level of a frog, whatever, or if I start acting like a frog, then that is, then I'm, that's like a, 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 a rebirth. If I, if I just live in the, in the animal state as a human being, and if I just sleep, eat, procreate, uh, survival of the fittest uh, attitude of, of ju- and the, live in the, in the kind of an- wild animal realm, then that, that kind of mental state to me is, is, is being born in that realm. When we, when we can, say, develop concentration to where, where we find conscious experience, to, to its more radiant forms, such as the Brahma Loka, where we can, we can, we can radiate, we can develop uh, this, this, uh, the radiant qualities that we have, uh, then that is very refined, very beautiful, very precious experience. But we can also we can experience those states in this in this, in this form in this in this state we're in now just through our minds. We can we can experience demonic hatred and and uh, uh, the desire for revenge and jealousies and and uh, wanting to destroy and kill. And we can see what's going on so much of the world. There's a lot of. Uh, Demons that that look like human beings, they look like men and women, but they don't. Their actions are demonic. And the human realm is a realm of, say, they in 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 terms of 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 rebirth is is the realm which we we take on responsibility for action and speech. We're not just. We, we have the ability to, to choose to refrain from doing bad things. We have the ability to choose to do good. That's what I call rebirth in the human realm. It's not just physical, is it? It's, it is a deliberate choice we make as a mental experience, a choice to take, to be responsible for actions and speech. And this is, this is our, this is the the miracle of our humanity is that all of us have this ability. We can all choose. We aren't just helplessly caught victims of, of the conditioned uh, uh, karmic effects uh, that we have. We can reflect on them. We can say no to the bad tendencies and, and yes to the good ones. So the human is in, in terms of of the Buddhist teaching, at least this is how I interpret it, is is a rebirth that we choose. It's like taking the five precepts. It's like and and really intending to to follow them, not just taking them like a parrot, but actually. Uh, being quite sincere and using them as a, as a guide for action and speech.
then the human ability, the human uh, birth in Buddhist terms is the, is the most, is the best opportunity for realizing the deathless, realizing Nibbana. Why is that? Because in this state we're in, with these, with these physical forms, these bodies, and the sensitivity, and the pain, and the suffering we all have to experience in this form, uh, we, 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 d we can't delude ourselves with, with a lot of happiness for very long. I mean, life for us is not going to be just an a, a, a incredibly continuous happy experience. We have to, in this form, and say on this planet, and in the, the way things change, and the human, uh, and the human conditions that we we have in this sense world of the four elements, it is it's quite coarse realm in, in compared to say Brahma realms with its, with its radiances. So we have to we have to bear with the coarseness and the inconvenience the difficulties of our human bodies with their aging, with their sicknesses, with, the, with, the, uh, see, with seeing the death and decay of those things around us, the loss of the loved, uh, the death of our parents. And, or this is a part of our human experience. But we ponder, we contemplate, we learn, and then we, we realize, say, at, at the when we do this in the right way, that nobody ever really was born, so nobody ever really dies. Things change, what begins ends. But, but what, we, what we perceive as a person, or that is, merely, is a perception in our mind. What we, uh, even the, the perceptions of ourselves, the me and mine, conditioning of, of of our minds is only a condition that arises and ceases in the mind. So we're letting these things resolve themselves. They're, they're, they're dissolving in the mind. They're, they're dis, they're, they, they come, they, they go. And that which is aware, they, that which is purely aware, that is your refuge. So when we say mindfulness, the path to the deathless, uh, it's a mindfulness, the apamado amatapadang. Mindfulness is the path to the deathless. Heedlessness is the way to death. So heedlessness is not knowing this, not understanding things as they really are. So we're caught in just the force of habit of our mind. We just react, caught in the reactions we've developed. Some good, some bad. But they are reactions, and we can't see beyond them until we use the, our intuitive abilities, our reflective abilities, willingness to to open, to feel, to to note, to pay attention to the way things are, not from the way things should be, not comparing the way things are how we think it is to the way it should be, but recognizing the, the pattern of the, the relationship of the condition to the unconditioned, the presence of passion and the absence of it. That ability to, to note and pay attention to that, that is the real refuge. The island that you cannot go beyond. See, read this again. There is an island, an island which you cannot go beyond. It is a place of nothingness, a place of non-possession and of non-attachment. It is the total end of death and decay. And this is why I call it Nibbana. There are people who in mindfulness have realized this and are completely cooled here and now. They do not become slaves working for Mara, for death. They cannot fall into his power. So this is a Buddhist statement. There are people. This is, this isn't, he's not just proclaiming something that, that we can't do. You know, it's not 
the Buddha's teaching is not aimed so high that we we that we can't do it. It's not a it's not Dhamma for for Devadas and angels. It's also for them, but it's also for us. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 this is where and also we we, we realize that 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 the, because it is uh, it's about the way things are then each one of us we we learn from the way we are you're not trying to learn from the way somebody else is and so this is why this reflective uh, awareness of the way things are you're you're contemplating your own feelings your own body your own Habits, tendencies, whatever they might be, uh, not in the, not in the, not judging, criticizing, or comparing them to anyone else, but recognizing them as, is as dhammas. What arises ceases. Is non-self. So this way, when you really appreciate this, you begin to realize, and you begin to even feel grateful for the way you are, even where before you used to think. Why do I have to be this way? I used to think this. Why do I have to be? Why couldn't I be like somebody else who seems much better off than I am? Remember when I was a teenager, I used to think, why did I get such a dirty deal? <laughs> why couldn't I be like so and so? You know, he he's really you know really got everything and got all the brains, the looks, the whole lot, and here I am. Not fair. Then you, then, you, then you find out that that person uh, isn't all that pleased with what he has either. <laughs> <laughs> and so then one, one is more, you know, grateful for what you have and, and the opportunity that we have to hear the Dhamma and to practice it. This is a real, where gratitude really becomes very strong is that all of us now have this opportunity. We, here in Britain, we can. Now, it's not, Buddhism isn't some remote uh, philosophy that is unavailable, is it? We're now listening. We're now, it's now available. There's so many books. There's so many opportunities for listening to it, for reading, for study, for practice. Then the real thing is to do it, to apply it, not to just uh, accumulate knowledge about Buddhism, probably better than accumulate knowledge about other things, but <laughs> it, well, it, that's not really going to liberate you till you apply it to your, your, the way you are, your, your experience, the, the, the emotions you're, f- you're feeling, the habits that you have, the fears, the desires, the the tendencies that that you're experiencing. That is your path, but you're seeing it now in the right way rather than in the way of the critic, the way of vanity, the way of of ignorance. So uh, I offer this a reflection for this afternoon and we can have a tea break, three o'clock now, and uh, in about 15 minutes... We'll reassemble for further discussion on this subject.